quick warning you guys, this video will be covering an adult show with adult themes about sexuality and grief and depression, so uh, don't watch around the kitties, okay? And as always, these are just my opinions, have fun watching me rail against my own film education, I might get some stuff wrong, etc. Now then. After some pretty standard bouncing, you realize he's edging towards your asshole. But you're drunk, and he made the effort to come all the way here, so you let him. He's thrilled. Oh, and you spend the rest of the day wondering, do I have a massive asshole? Fleabag Began Life is a one-woman show, which in and of itself began on a challenge from a friend to write a 10-minute sketch for a stand-up comedy night. The sketch would become the shocking, hard-edged play written and acted by Phoebe Waller-Bridge and directed by her friend Vicky Jones. And then that play would become a TV show. You know that feeling when a guy you like sends you a text at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday night asking if he can come and find you, and you've accidentally made it out like you've just got in yourself, so you have to get out of bed, drink half a bottle of wine, get in the shower, shave everything, dig out some agent provocateur business, suspend about the whole bit and wait by the door until the buzzer goes. And then you get to it immediately. So Fleabag stars Phoebe Waller-Bridge as a woman struggling. Her guinea pig-themed cafe is about to go under, her sister dislikes her, her father avoids her, her godmother is a sociopath, and her best friend recently died from... As it turns out, bikes go fast and flip you into the road. Three people died. She's such a dick. And she copes with all of this through a lot of sex and through... us. But we'll get to that. First, let's meet the cast. At the top, there's the eponymous Fleabag, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. We don't ever actually get a name for her in the show, she's just Fleabag. And I'll get to the names thing in a bit, but first let's just meet the lady. Fleabag is a feminist, possibly a bad one. We are bad feminists. She's trying to be a good sister. He's still got that thing on his... Come on, you can do it. I don't have to yes, say... Come no, on, little not one, here. Come on, please. No. Penis. Thank you. And daughter. The next man who walks in here is getting ridden to death. Dad! Not ideal. And doesn't always succeed. I think you should go. She tried to be a good friend, except when she didn't. Her mom died a few years ago, and her best friend accidentally committed suicide a few months ago. Then there's her guinea pig-themed cafe, which is... failing. I also fucked it into liquidation. Basically, she's a self-loathing, incredibly lonely person, quietly raging against the unfairness of the universe and desperately flailing around for any kind of human connection to fill the endless void. Do you want to go for a drink? Do you want to come home with me? Usually that just means sex. Because I spent most of my adult life using sex to deflect from the screaming void inside my empty heart. I'm good at this. But even when she does make a real connection with somebody, there are complications. What was that? Where did you, where did you just go? Then we have her family. There's her sister Claire, played by Sean Clifford. My sister. She's uptight and beautiful and probably anorexic. You're almost late. She and Fleabag have something of a fraught relationship because Claire is very repressed and in a bit of a subpar marriage and Fleabag likes to say whatever she's thinking all the time, no matter the consequences. Don't get drunk and shit in your sink again. When are you gonna stop bringing that up? When you do something better? You on your period. Why would you ask that? The flats. No reason. Say it. The plans. Basically, they clash a lot. Oh, oh, God. God. What was that? Fucking hug! Oh, why the fuck did you do oh. that? It was terrifying! Never do that again! There's Dad, played by Bill Patterson. Dad's way of coping with two motherless daughters was to buy us tickets to feminist lectures, start fucking our godmother, and eventually stop calling. Dad does not know what to do with his two daughters. He's emotionally and verbally stunted to the point that he can barely speak to them, especially when he should be saying something kind. He's in a relationship with their godmother, who is horrible, and he sort of knows it, and he seems eternally bewildered by Fleabag. I have a horrible feeling that I'm a greedy, morally bankrupt woman who can't even call herself a feminist. You get all that from your mother. Then we have Godmother, played by Olivia Coleman. To be fair, she's not an evil stepmother. She's just a cunt. She's horrible. Please look after yourself. You really do look ghastly, Dan. Like, so unbelievably horrible in the most passive-aggressive ways. It's about power. Seriously, she's the worst. 
Then we have Martin, played by Brett Gelman. Martin. Martin. He's Claire's husband and an inappropriate alcoholic with boundary issues. He's one of those men who is explosively sexually inappropriate with everyone, but makes you feel bad if you take offense because he was just being fun. He's kind of sad in a way where he knows he kind of sucks, but he seems incapable of bettering himself. And then he does shit like this. And this. It's the kid's choice if it wants to jump ship, right? Yeah, he's pretty terrible. Then rounding out the main cast, we have Jenny Rainsford as Boo, Fleabag's dead best friend, and Andrew Scott as the priest in series two. What was that? It wasn't a fox, was it? We'll get to them soon, I promise. This is an excellent one. So series one of Fleabag starts by introducing us to Fleabag, much as she's introduced to us in the original play, as the lonely sex addict with the failing cafe. I'm just gonna ask her, I'm just gonna come. Do you need to borrow money? No. Can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. She tries to get a loan from a bank to save her cafe, and then this happens. I thought I had a top one underneath. Yeah, okay. No, seriously. Please leave. Herb. Slut. Wow. And this scene is actually how the play starts, sort of. Series 1 would go to a lot of places the play didn't, but most of the major moments and characters that appear in the play do crop up over the course of Series 1 in some form, with the exception of the chatty cafe patron Joe, who doesn't show up until Series 2. And by the end of that first episode, she's drunkenly hammering on her dad's door at 2 a.m. I just, uh... Ask nothing. He calls her a cab, and after some prompting, we learn why Fleabag is currently like this. I opened the cafe with my friend Boo. Yeah, she's dead now. She accidentally killed herself. A couple months before the start of series one, Fleabag's best friend Boo discovered her boyfriend was cheating on her, so she decided to throw herself into the bike lane next to the road. She was only planning on breaking a finger and ending up in the hospital where she wouldn't let the boyfriend see her as punishment for his infidelity, but her plan didn't exactly go... well, you know. And so Fleabag is alone in the world now, uprooted and at sea. You see, Boo was the only tether she had left her closest connection to another human being since her mother's death. With all the love I have for her, I don't know where to put it now. I'll take it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It sounds lovely. <laughs> it's gotta go somewhere. Boo was that perfectly imperfect friend we all either have or have been wishing for for years. No, seriously, there's nothing wrong with your nose. I mean, there's nothing wrong. Say that again. I mean, there's nothing. What? I don't know. Oh my god! I always say the wrong thing! And the two of them had each other's backs. It was them against the world. Let's never ask anyone for anything. They don't get it. Deal. I mean, technically, Fleabag does have this boyfriend, but... I admire how much Harry commits to our breakups. Yeah, they aren't really happening long term. You don't like other girls. You can keep up. Ugh. And in her absence, Boo's presence is a constant specter sitting just off to one side, haunting Fleabag and us alongside her. Hi, this is Boo. I can't come to the phone right now, but please leave me a messy Argio, and I will get back to you. Anyway, that's the very reason why they put rubbers on the end of pencils. What the fuck happens to this? No. Because people make mistakes. There have been some theories that the person Fleabag is always talking to when she looks at the camera is actually Boo, or her ghost or something. It's a cool theory, although not one I'm holding on to. So anyway, Boo is dead and Fleabag is a wreck without her, throwing herself at literally any warm body that will have her. Fuck me up the ass. I mean, based on what we learned, she might have been struggling with this even before Boo's death, but since then... <laughs> I hate myself. Yeah, I think it's safe to say this isn't exactly going well. And of all the people in her life, it seems that Claire is the only one who's even paying attention to what a train wreck Fleabag has become. I mean, in fairness, she's not exactly doing so hot herself. We've paid them to let us clean their house in silence. <laughs> And let me just take a minute to talk about how much I love this show's portrayal of sisters. Shit. I'm wearing the top that she lost. This is gonna be tense. Are you okay? Yeah? Tell the truth. It's that perfect blend of familiarity and frustration that I find really relatable, and not something I see on screen very often. 
You see, movies love to delve into brothers. Maybe it's some archetypal Cain and Abel nonsense, I don't know, but man, media just loves them brothers. Or sometimes a brother and sister pair just for variety. But aside from Parent Trap, Frozen, and Lilo and Stitch, there aren't a lot of pieces of media about sisters, or pieces of media that explore the relationship between sisters in any meaningful way. I mean, I can think of one or two indie flicks and some bad rom-coms, but nothing that really resonated with me. I really don't know why this is, although I'm going to hazard a guess that it's got something to do with misogyny and the patriarchy and a lack of women writers in Hollywood, but I don't know. I really don't. And by the way, Sean Clifford and Phoebe Waller have been good friends for a long time and always wanted to play sisters in something. To be able to do it on our own terms as well has been really fun because it means every single time we have an idea or even sometimes a little moment just happens between us, we're a bit like, going in. And that brings us back to Claire and Fleabag, who are so good together. In series one, we watch them try to reconnect or try to just connect at all because they've been in each other's lives forever, but I get the feeling it's been like this. Oh, for a while, and they do come together eventually. In episode four, when their dad sends them off to a silent women's retreat, the shared proximity sort of brings it out of them. Until we get to Claire's big news. She got the big promotion she's always wanted at her job, and it would mean going to Finland, putting a lot of miles between herself and her terrible husband, her weird stepson, and her fucked up sister. Why aren't you getting on a plane to your cold rich future? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why? Because you can't! Just Fuck off on aeroplanes and leave your weird stepson and broken sister to fend for themselves, okay? Fleabag tells her to go, for the money and for herself, and Claire resolves to do that, until... You're not going to Finland. In the last episode of series one, we watch all the tenuous bits of a decent life that Fleabag managed to pull together for six episodes come crashing down around her. Her ridiculously hot, maybe boyfriend dumps her for another woman, her actual boyfriend already dumped her and gets to make a victory lap with his new girlfriend, her godmother's behavior towards her is so egregious it pushes her over the edge, which leads to this, which leads to this. I deserve to be happy. I am allowed to move on. I have a good life. And I'm happy, all right? And this. I'm sorry you had to hear that. But you did have to hear it. And then there's this. He Please? came out into the garden. I don't want to hear it. Claire, you have to believe me. How can I believe you? Because I'm your sister. After what you did to Boo. And so Fleabag goes back to her gerbil-themed cafe. The theme was all Boo's idea after Fleabag got her Hillary. But Boo took Hillary very seriously as a gift, and soon everything became guinea pig related. Fleabag doesn't even like the damn thing, but it's the last piece of her friend that she has left. So she gives it one last pet and a bowl full of cucumber and contemplates following in Boo's footsteps. And then the bank manager comes back. You know, that one. Slut. Wow! You see, she bumped into the bank manager back at that retreat in episode 4. He was at some sort of men's betterment workshop next door. It mostly seemed to involve men yelling the word slut a lot. Slut! Yes? But anyway, they bumped into each other and had a sweet and honest moment together. He opened up about his mistakes and his dreams, and in the privacy of her own mind, so did Fleabag. I want to apologize to everyone. I want to take clean cups out of the dishwasher and the next morning I want to watch my wife drink from them. I just want to cry all the time. And so in the final episode, the bank manager stops by her cafe. Or more accurately, I think he was driving by and saw her looking ready to throw herself into the cycling lane and... You okay? They have a talk where she finally drops the act in front of another human being and just says what she's really thinking out loud. And I fucked up my family. Did you? And I fucked my friend by fucking her boyfriend. Right. And sometimes I wish I didn't even know that fucking existed. And that I know that my body as it is now really is the only thing I have left. And when that gets old and unfuckable, I may as well just kill it. You know, everyone feels like this is a little bit and they're just not talking about it. Or I am completely fucking alone. And the bank manager says, People make mistakes. That's why they put rubbers on the ends of pencils. And sits down to interview her again for that loan that might keep her cafe from closing down. I've uh, read through your application form. It says you run a cafe for guinea pigs. <laughs> Told you it was funny. And that's the end of series one. 
The play ends similarly with a version of this scene, and in either version, her life is still a total wreck, but there's the tiniest glimmer of something better on the horizon. Also in the show, she keeps stealing this gold statue from her shitty godmother, and it's amazing. This show is about a lot of things. About cynicism, nihilism, religion, and according to its creator, female rage. Where's my vagina? Yeah. I don't carry a vagina around with me. <laughs> That'd be way too provocative. <laughs> Didn't get it. There is something so inherently feminine about the show in a way that might make some people uncomfortable. In the way the show unflinchingly portrays female cynicism and sexuality and a woman's want for sex, but also the idea of what she might or might not actually get out of sex. I'm not obsessed with sex. I just can't stop thinking about it. The performance of it. The awkwardness of it. Not so much the feeling of it. Fleabag likes to have sex, but she also doesn't seem to like it. I'm amazing. <laughs> He's wasting me. And Meaty likes to make jokes about the difficulties of women enjoying sex, a woman orgasming or faking it is played as a joke quite often, but here it's just a statement of fact. Hell, even when she does actually meet a man who's really good at it, she still doesn't really enjoy it. You made me come nine times. Nine times. And that's because as much as Fleabag seeks out the physical as a way to distract from her emotional issues, it seems that deep down she does actually want to love and be loved. I think you know how to love better than any of us. That's why you find it all so painful. I should probably state here that I don't think that's a universal statement about women. Women will get or not get whatever they want out of sex. People are different. I just like when media actually delves into a specific point of view because that's a hell of a lot more interesting than like... You know. Also, there's that interesting detail of how this show portrays sex. If Russian Doll kept us at a distance, Fleabag does the opposite, dropping us right into the middle of it without any warning or preamble. It's unemotional, cold even, as Fleabag will turn to us and casually narrate whatever she's experiencing, which, by the way, is a sign that she's not really engaging with the partner in question. The only time she doesn't do that is... Also, people often talk about how raunchy this show is. You don't actually see anything. I mean, there was a wall of ceramic penises in that rubber vagina in the sex shop, but the only real stuff we see is this. It was really important there was no kind of nudity or like sexual gratuity in the images, so you never see anyone naked. <laughs> what was really exciting is knowing that in a close-up, that the character mid-sex to turn around to you and go, and that's enough to put a lot of viewers off. <laughs> but what I find more interesting than all of that is the way this show hones in on the frustrations of being a modern day woman. Tell the truth. It's horrendous. I look like a pencil. There's an entire scene about the importance of women's hair. Hair isn't everything. Hair is everything. It's the difference between a good day and a bad day. We're meant to think that it's a symbol of power, that it's a symbol of fertility. Some people are exploited for it and it pays your fucking bills. Hair is everything. Being a modern woman can be tough, whether it's the dumb stuff like trying to look nice all the time, but not too nice at the wrong occasion. Oh, I just woke up so looking good. amazing and then everyone's gonna think I got a fucking facial for my mother's funeral. Oh, what the hell? You look incredible. Or trying to succeed professionally when people might judge you based on your gender. Are you a woman in business? Wait, don't you think it's good? To... No, no, it's ghettoizing. It's a subsection of success. Or even just trying to be a feminist while balancing all those shallow cares you can't seem to let go of, like your hair or your weight or the way a stranger on the street might judge you when you're having a good day. The walk of shame. Also, there's this. Women are born with pain built in. Period pains, sore boobs, childbirth, you know. We carry it within ourselves throughout our lives. Men don't. They have to seek it out. They invent all these gods and demons and things so they can feel guilty about things. And we have it all going on in here. I don't know if that's a universal fact, but it feels true to me and I suspect to a lot of women in the world. And it feels true to Fleabag, who is told constantly how alike she is to her dead mother. For better and for worse, she apparently has a lot in common with the woman who used to do angry squirrel voices in the park, the woman with great tits and farts that sounded either like a door opening or a suspicious duck, the woman who used to have too much fun for her husband. I loved her, but I didn't like that she was... Fleabag is not a perfect person, and she might not even be a good feminist all the time, but she's fascinating to watch as she navigates the waters of being a friend, a lover, a sister, and a daughter, and maybe how she learns to live with herself. <laughs> I hate myself. 
I'm sorry. I think you should go. I never said she was good at it. So after Fleabag's life almost completely falls apart and she's given a second chance at the loan for her cafe, series two starts, well, it starts like this. This is a love story. Did you know there wasn't even supposed to be a series two for Fleabag? Amazon and BBC came back and said, do you want to do it again? And I had a lot of integrity and I said, no, thank you very much, I'm an artist. Phoebe Waller said that after she stopped looking at the camera, the story was over. But then the show did well and she had an idea for what season two could be. So I thought, I was going to leave it, and then I had an idea of how I can play with the form again, and what the camera, what the audience would mean to her again, and what she would mean to the audience. So we're going on a different journey together. And I'll just say here and now that while I really like Series 1, I think Series 2 is absolutely phenomenal in the way it builds on what Series 1 gave us. So we find Fleabag a little over a year after the end of Series 1. She's picked herself up, stopped having sex altogether, Can I at least go down on you? Started exercising more, Fly! and just generally trying to live a better, healthier life. Putting pie nuts on your salad doesn't make you a grown-up. Fucking does. She hasn't spoken to her sister since that night at the Godmother's art exhibition, except for this. It's lovely that this time of year. They're at this dinner celebrating their dad's engagement to Godmother. Ta-da! Also, there's this guy. I don't know who this guy is. Not as long as you confess. <laughs> oh god, he's their priest. Then you have nothing to fucking worry about. <laughs> their cool sweary priest. And over the course of the first episode, we learn that not only has Fleabag gone and tried to be better, her cafe is actually doing well now. It really is. It actually is. We learn that Claire went to Finland, and she's really convinced herself that everything in her life is absolutely fine. I take all the negative emotions and just bottle them and bury them, and they never come out. I'm not sure I've basically true. never been better. She's also trying to have a baby with Martin, and this cool priest is going to be marrying Dad and Godmother at their wedding. And possibly the biggest surprise of the evening for everyone is this new and mildly improved flea bag. Her attempts at good behavior seem to have them really on edge. Well, you're being very... Well, you're not being naughty. You're being so quiet. Why aren't you saying anything? That is, of course, until this happens. Excuse me. Claire, you've been ages. I'm not looking at your period. Just take this. Oh, God. It's not a period. It's fucking miscarriage, okay? And then Claire goes back to dinner, pretending that everything is still fine, when all Fleabag wants to do is get her to the hospital, which is a really sane reaction to this insane situation. And in the end, this happens. Next oh, for fuck's sake! Stop next. it! Here we go. Sorry, I just... What's to... happened? Nothing's happened. What's happened? No. Something's happened. Claire asked her not to tell anyone about it, and so... I just, I just had a little... I just, this is a safe space. I just... Come on. I had a, a little miscarriage. In her panic to find some excuse that might get them out of this dinner, Fleabag claims Claire's miscarriage. What the fuck? And then this happens. That's probably for the best. You know, it's like a goldfish out the bowl sort of thing. It's the kid's choice if it wants to jump ship, right? <laughs> and this. <laughs> And this. And now we're back to the mirror and the love story. The priest stayed behind to make sure she was okay because he believes she just had a miscarriage. He gives her his address and tells her to come by anytime. And then Fleabag finds Claire waiting for her with a cab. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Can you take us to the nearest hospital, please? Yep. Yeah. Also, this happens. The priest is quite hot. It's so hot. And thus begins series two, the love story. So I do have to just really quickly talk about the music for this show, because it is consistently fascinating and never what you expect. The opening title track for Series 1 is just this. That's it. I didn't cut it or anything. It's just barely two seconds of frantic cacophonous jazz. I didn't even know if that track has a name, since it seems most of the soundtrack has never been officially released, and I couldn't find a single interview with the composer or showrunner that talked about this choice. And yet it's fitting to have such an abrupt, frenetic piece as the title track for Series 1. It really does feel like somebody put Fleabag's mental state into musical form. And by the way, the music for the show is composed by Phoebe Waller's sister, Isabel Waller-Bridge. The pair are apparently quite close. Isabel described a shorthand for collaborating where Phoebe would say, I need it to be a bit like this, but she'd scrunch up her face or something. For the show's credit music, they settled on a rock guitar riff. Isabel said that when the pair discussed it, they said her theme should be unapologetic. We were like, she's gotta be badass. Even though she does cruel things and she's mean, we've got to like her. And then we were like, what about some heavy metal? 
so that's her main musical identity in Series 1. A frantic, interrupted piece of jazz and a badass rock guitar riff. It kind of feels like the rock guitar is the front she puts up, and that abrupt little piece of jazz is what's really going on inside her head. And then we get to Series 2, and we lose that opening bit of jazz in favor of... Because if Series 1 was about a woman falling apart, then Series 2 is about her trying to put herself back together and find meaning. There is some religion involved, but it's an interesting choice to make this the musical identity for most of Series 2. Unlike Series 1, we actually get a fair bit of this music throughout the show. In Series 1, we got other tracks like A Distant Dream by New York Jazz Lounge or Mirror Lake by Angus McRae, but this show is fairly sparse with its music and that badass rock guitar only comes in for the credits. So it's interesting how prominent these vaguely Christian musical cues are in Series 2. I have a feeling it has as much to do with the love story as it does with religion. And by the way, in one Series 2 track, Kiri, some of the lyrics are about vaginas and stuff in Greek. Seriously, they snuck in dirty lyrics in Greek. And while we're talking about religion and sex, let's talk about... So in Series 2, we meet the priest. Like Fleabag, he doesn't have a name, and fans like to call him the Hot Priest. After Series 1's endless slog of terrible men she chooses to sleep with, Series 2 begins with an abstinent Fleabag. Do you want to have sex? No. And then she falls in love with a Catholic priest. I'd spend 40 days and 40 nights in that dessert. Oh god, I fancy a priest. And the thing is, this is not a one-sided thing. What if you meet someone you like? I talk and drink and laugh and give them Bibles and hope they eventually leave me alone. What if you meet someone you love? The priest has clearly lived a hard life before he found religion. His parents are alcoholics and his brother is... He's a pedophile. Also, there's this. It won't bring any good. I've been there many times. How many times? Many. You see, the problem is that, for once, it isn't just about lust for Fleabag. I mean, it is about that, too. <sighs> it's beautiful, Meg. But for once, it's about something deeper, too. I'd really like to be your friend, though. I'd like to be your friend, too. We'll last a week. The more time the two of them spend together, the more it becomes clear that they're falling in love. Yeah, I believe I'm supposed to love people as a father. We can arrange that. <laughs> a father of many. I'll go up to three. It's not gonna happen. Two, then. Okay, two. I think they fall in love with each other for all their messy quirks and weirdness. I sometimes worry that I wouldn't be such a feminist if I had bigger tits. <laughs> the foxes have been after me for years. When I was at a monastery, I woke up just feeling a bit weird, like there might be a fox about. And a fox <laughs> was sitting underneath my window looking at me like this. And they do fall in love as much as they don't want to. I can't have sex with you because I'll fall in love with you. We're going to have sex, aren't we? Also, I do want to take a quick second and just say how happy I am to see Andrew Scott in something good. All the dumb stuff with Moriarty and Sherlock wasn't really his fault. He delivered exactly what they asked for. I just think that after Sherlock, I thought, because it was so plot driven, are you dead? Is Sherlock dead? Is anybody, am I dead? But between this show and A Handsome Devil, I'm just really pleased to see Andrew Scott getting some nice meaty roles for a change, since he's usually just cast as dumb villains and stuff like Spectre. Also, Phoebe wrote the role for him, and the two were in a play together back in 2009 called Roaring Trade, and these are images from that. So that's fun. But back to the priest, who is, as it happens, not just a love interest. He also represents the idea of a higher power, but it's like, okay, if you saw the Russian doll video, then you know I'm extremely Jewish and I don't go here. Judaism is really different, y'all. Please stop comparing them and remove the term Judeo-Christian from this earth, please. But seeing how Christianity tends to dominate the world and media at large, I do find this to be a really interesting take on it. Do you think I should become a Catholic? No, don't do that. I like that you believe in a meaningless existence. The funeral liturgy says that life is changed, not ended. I've always loved that, if that's of any help. Perhaps because it's one that feels so personal. The world was made in seven days, and on the first day, light came, and then a few days later, the sun came. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you believe that? It's not fact. It's poetry. It's moral code. It's for interpretation to help us work out God's plan for us. I love that we have this character who chose this life and genuinely finds joy and fulfillment in it. Through all the kind of controversy around the church, especially the Catholic church and, all, and religion, a lot of the time, a lot of the basic on the ground, uh, like good things about them are lost. 
and like the basic Christian principles of just don't be a dick and don't kill anyone and like be nice and like share and all wrapped up in one person who was also a real man. The priest is willing to be alone and a little lonely if it means keeping that meaning and purpose and poetry in his life and in a sense I think that's some of what attracts Fleabag to him. That sense of purpose and faith. Because she might be putting her life together, but she still feels that loss. That palpable sense of something missing. At one particularly low point, she actually goes to the church to pray. That thought is interrupted by the priest, who seems to be having a bit of a meltdown alone in his little office. Probably about the fight they had earlier, where Fleabag couldn't tell him about Boo. I'm just trying to help you. You should probably be getting back to God, don't you think? In the end, he asks her to try confessing her sins. Why would I Because tell it will make you feel sins. better. And because I want to know. It starts out cute enough, much like the therapy session she had two episodes ago, with jokes. And there's been a spot of sodomy, a bit of violence, and of course, the endless fucking blasphemy. But pretty soon, she finally manages to say something real. I just think I want someone to tell me how to live my life, Father, because so far, I think I've been getting it wrong. Which leads to this. Just fucking tell me what to do, Father. Neil. Which leads to this. Which leads to this. And finally, in the end, to this. We're gonna have sex, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. So now that we have the setup, Let's take a minute to talk about the fourth wall. The term originates in theater, where most proscenium stages have three walls along the back and sides of the stage, but no fourth wall. Instead of that fourth wall, there is an audience. Therefore, the phrase breaking the fourth wall has always been more of a theoretical concept rather than a literal one. And of course, theater has broken that conceptual wall over and over again for years. Pick any Shakespeare play and there will inevitably be a moment when... To be or not to be, that is the question. Every Shakespeare play has a moment when a character disengages from the scene they're in and turns to us, the audience, and expresses their innermost thoughts. Other characters in the room don't hear these asides. They are for the audience and the audience alone. Here comes Beatrice. By this day, she's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. It's of course noteworthy then that Fleabag started as a play. I woke in the morning to find a note from Harry saying that was the last which is pretty out of the blue to be honest. I realized he was counting straws, but nice to know he was paying attention. Hey look, it's the needy waitress from series two. But then we get into film and breaking the fourth wall took two distinct shapes. One of them was more... Camelot. 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 It's only a model. Shh. There's a metatextual fourth wall break in film that happens when characters acknowledge the tropes and trappings of the film they're in. They know they're in a movie and they reference it for a joke or for whatever this is. Because I don't like you. Oh, I hate you, you snotty son of a- I pretend I didn't hear that. Having some fun now. Thor, were you fighting with the narrator? Although even this too can be traced back to Shakespeare. But the other kind of fourth wall break goes straight back to those soliloquies of old. If you ask me, everybody in this theater is a giant sucker, especially you! The direct address and the act of looking at the camera mimics the intimacy in a theater when an actor addresses an audience. And we've had a lot of this in film over the years, but it's usually done for the sake of a joke or being edgy or whatever. In interviews, Waller-Bridge discussed a wanting to mess with the form and with expectations. She said she was fascinated by the relationship between an audience and performer. So what was exciting for me about the first series was I felt like the, I'm inviting the audience in because it's direct address. And then by the end, the character is trying to push the audience away. And so I wanted the audience to feel complicit and that was a strange experience for them. But also there's the fact that this is her coping mechanism. In a manner of speaking, we are her coping mechanism. Oh, so you do have someone to talk to. Yeah. Many people might feel the need to put on an act sometimes, and in a sense, we are the audience to her act, her never-ending facade. In series one, she keeps the true nature of her portrayal of Boo a secret, and when Claire reveals it, she looks at us with horror, and then practically runs from the camera. In the play, she goes even further, trying to defend herself to the audience by saying, that wasn't my fault. He wanted me. He wanted me. But in the show, she can't even muster up the excuse. And she doesn't look at us again for the rest of the episode because now we know her shame. 
The pressure of the camera was that she had a secret and she felt like she was going to crack under the pressure of the camera saying like, there's something going on with you. What is that? And she's going, I'm just hilarious. Come into my hilarious life. There's nothing wrong with me, I swear. In series two, when Fleabag goes to therapy, the therapist asks if she has any friends and initially she says no, but then she changes her answer. Do you see them a lot? Oh, they're, <laughs> they're always there. They're, they're always there. Because now we know it all, and we're just along for the ride. We're the little voice in the back of her head, the one stable presence in her life, even if we're not really in her life. It's still a facade, but the tone of it has changed somewhat. I think last time she knew why it was there, and this time I don't think she knows, and which means she knows that there's a journey she's going to go on, there's another thing she has to learn about herself, but this time she's not aware of it. If series one was almost conspiratorial, series two is, well, confessional. She, don't say it, she, she actually, uh, just, just don't say it, she actually orgasmed when she finished it. Just said it. And then this happens. Will last a week. What was that? Where did you, where did you just go? And that is the moment when the series as we know it starts to break down. Because every time Fleabag is looking at us, engaging with us, she's disengaging from the world around her. And the priest is the first person who actually notices. He's a bit annoying, actually. What is that? <laughs> that thing that you're doing, it's like you disappear. There's this idea that Vanity Fair television critic Sonia Soraya put into words when reviewing Fleabag series 2. The need to be seen, but also the horror that comes with being seen. And that's what this is. Tell me, come on, no, tell me. Nothing. Ah, nothing. Because the priest sees her, really sees her. He just went somewhere. It's amazing and also terrifying. Oh my God, we're gonna have sex. For fuck's sake, stop that! We are her coping mechanism, but we're also the baggage she's dragging around behind her and he's the first person who sees it. A lot of people like to theorize about what all that means, about who Fleabag is talking to, and I think it comes down to the names, or the lack of them. And I see, this is, um, this is, this is, God, how extraordinary. I always call you darling. In an interview with Decider, Wallerbridge said on the subject of her own character's lack of a name, I wanted something that would create an immediate subtext for the character. So calling her Fleabag, calling the show Fleabag, gives the subtext of Fleabagginess. She looks like she's got stuff together, and yet her name betrays the subtext of her. In another interview, she said, I think it's because I felt like there's an element of the every woman about her that I wanted to keep and that she wasn't somebody who, um, yeah, could be defined. And a few characters get names, like Claire or Boo, but so many of them are just needy waitress, dad, godmother, the priest, or Fleabag. Fleabag becomes almost archetypal for the lack of her name, unique and undefined in such a way that we can identify with her. She is the lens through which we see the world, and it's not always a rosy look, but we get to see it all entirely through her eyes. Every character we meet, we meet through her. I don't know who this guy is. Martin. Martin! And the lack of names, along with those constant asides, bring us further inside her point of view. It makes us relate to her in such a way where, even if we don't have all of her specific problems, there's something about this. And that I know that my body as it is now really is the only thing I have left, and when that gets old and unfuckable, I may as well just kill it. I just think I want someone to tell me how to live my life, Father, because so far I think I've been getting it wrong that feels so familiar. We may not have dealt with her particular issues, but we've all felt like this sometimes. Like we're stupid or mean or broken inside. Fleabag is talking to us because we're the little voice in her head, but also because, in a sense, we are Fleabag. So after all that, let's look at the finale of series two. Over the course of series two, we learned a bit more about the death of Fleabag's mother. I just... I don't know what to do. I know. Buck up. Smile. Charm. Off we go. We learned that, yes, Martin's son really is that creepy. Tell her to leave him. We learned that Claire was relieved about the miscarriage because it meant she wouldn't be having Martin's baby. And also, she has a massive crush on her Finnish co-worker, Claire. What's his name? Claire. To be fair, he seems really sweet. Oh my god, Claire, I love your hair! <laughs> it's so cute and edgy! Also, this happened. Just thought we were hanging out, just as friends. We're not friends. We are sisters. Get your own friends. Which 
Oof, that hurt. We also spent a bit more time with Fleabag and the priest, and she eventually told him that she faked the miscarriage to cover for her sister's real one, but she never told him about Boo. Also, the two of them had sex. So episode 6 of series 2 begins with that dreaded wedding we've been building up to all series long. It's gonna be a lovely day, isn't it? I'm afraid so. Fleabag goes to finally, properly return the statue she stole from Godmother, and then this happens. Do you know, I often thought it strange that of all my pieces you chose to take her. Why? She was based on your mother. They go back outside, and after some more passive aggression from Godmother, Claire finally admits to her, the priest, her father, and her husband that it was her miscarriage all along. It was my fucking miscarriage! <laughs> it was my baby! I guess it was your baby's way of saying it didn't want you as its father. Like a goldfish out of the bowl sort of thing. And then she demands a divorce. I am not going to leave you until you are down on your knees and begging me. Please leave me. Then dad goes missing before the ceremony and godmother is forced to ask for their help. Please. And Fleabag finds him up in the attic with a case of cold feet and his foot stuck in a mouse trap. It's more the cold feet than the mouse trap, really. Do you want to make a run for it? I can smuggle you out in one of mom's dresses. You would as well. <laughs> But in the end, it's clear that he does want this. God only knows why, since Godmother is a horrible sociopath, but it seems that this will make him happy enough, which is all anybody can ask for. So when he tries to say he can't, Fleabag tells him, Buck up. Smiles. Charm. Off we go. And he says, I think you know how to love better than any of us. That's why you find it all so painful. I love this bit. It's such a touching little button on two series of a difficult relationship. In the end, we get this sweet and slightly terrifying moment when Dad is just too scared to let go of Fleabag. We were just reminded again how much Fleabag is like her mother. You're the way you are because of her. And it's those bits that you need to cling to. And it feels like this is one last leap of faith or terror that he has to make as he says goodbye to his former life with Fleabag's mother. Afterward, this happens. Thank you. And thank you. But first, the priest has to give his speech, and Claire has to sort her shit out. You go and get him. You go and get him? Is it running through the airport kind of love? I'm not going to the airport. You think I was insane. I don't know when his flight is, or which terminal. Imagine if I knew that. Imagine him finding out I knew all that. Imagine if he was just in boots, buying a pair of tweezers in Terminal 5, and suddenly I was there. Hello, Claire. Yeah, okay, that would be intense. The only person I'd run through an airport for is you. Did I mention I love these two so freaking much? And then the priest starts his speech. Love is awful. It's awful. It makes you say and do things you never thought you would do! There's something wrong with your priest. You see, earlier, when Fleabag and the priest frantically made out by the side of the house, this happened. I don't know. Oh, I don't know what this feeling is. <sighs> is it God or is it me? I don't know. And well... Claire leaves to go hunt down Claire, and the priest finishes his speech. Love isn't something that weak people do. Being a romantic takes a hell of a lot of hope. I think what they mean is, when you find somebody that you love, it feels like hope. Go out the side way. Now. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope. In the Lord. And Fleabag goes to wait at their bus stop, and the priest meets her. They talk for a few minutes in that companionable, but not quite comfortable way, because they're both just delaying the inevitable. It's God, isn't it? Yeah. That speech he gave, that raging, romantic, frustrated, lovely speech, was about making the choice to love. And he had to choose between his faith or Fleabag, and he chose faith. You know, the worst thing is... That I fucking love you. The vulnerability of this scene is the real culmination of her growth over the whole series. Maybe happiness isn't in what you believe, but who you believe. Because in the end, her belief in him is what brought this moment of real, brave confession. I love you. Not some holy religious thing, but still, something precious and sacred. She opens herself up and tells him that she loves him and she means it. And in a sense, they're both finally brave enough to face this moment even as it's ending. He gets up to leave, tells her to never come to his church again, and then he says, I love you too. Okay. 
and then he's gone. And earlier he said, It'll pass. Which is perhaps the hardest and most true thing of all. Everything passes, everything ends, and with enough time, both of them will move on because they have to and because that's life. Because they can't be together, and they both know it. And then she sees a fox. Maybe it's a sign from God or a joke, but she sees an actual fucking fox. He went that way. Valerie Clark from Screen Rant posited that the fox and the priest's obsession with foxes might actually just be his own weird emotional baggage slash coping mechanism externalized. Oh, oh God, fuck oh, your hair. I thought you were a fox. Maybe the fox isn't strictly real, much in the same way that Fleabag isn't looking at a literal camera, but it's a coping mechanism made physical for him and us to see. So the way he can see Fleabag looking at us, she can see his fox. Whatever it means, she sends the fox on its way and the song This Feeling by the Alabama Shake starts to play. The lyrics talk about a person who's been struggling for a long time, about how they finally have a feeling that things are gonna be all right. She opens up her bag to reveal the statue she stole from Godmother, the statue inspired by her mother who's been haunting her since before the series began. Fleabag said once that she was afraid of forgetting things, forgetting people. I don't think she'll ever have to worry about that, but I'm still glad she has another piece of her mother to hold on to. And then Fleabag looks at us. At her imaginary friend and audience. Her coping mechanism, her facade. And when we try to follow her, she just shakes her head. She's finally outgrown us, and she's ready to move on to whatever the next stage of her life is going to be. And that means saying goodbye. And it means that everything is going to be all right. In the end, I'm sure she'll have many more loves and losses because she's strong and brave and knows how to love better than any of us, in spite of it all being so painful. It reminds me a little bit of the ending of Stephen Jabosky's seminal novel, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. In it, the protagonist Charlie writes letters to a friend. The first letter begins, Dear friend, I am writing to you because she said you listen and understand and didn't try to sleep with that person at that party even though you could have. And that is how Charlie begins to tell us his story, as a friend. At the end of the book, I'm just gonna paraphrase a little here, but he says, If this does end up being the last letter, I just want you to know that I was in a bad place before I started high school and you helped me. Even if you didn't know what I was talking about or know someone who's gone through it, you made me not feel alone. Because I know there are people who say all these things don't happen. I know these will all be stories someday, and our pictures will become old photographs, but right now, these moments are not stories. And this is the moment when you know you're not a sad story. That's what this moment in Fleabag makes me think of. The moment when we know that this isn't a sad story. We know that we helped her through a hard time, and maybe she helped us. And now we, all we Fleabags in the world, have been given a little encouragement to go out into the world and fuck it up beautifully, just like she does. Hello, friends. I just bastardized a John Waters quote. Oh, how fun. Also, I referenced Russian Doll a lot, largely because of the female creators and fucked up protagonists who are witty and acerbic and stuff. Basically, I would love to see Nadia and Fleabag interact. I feel like both shows are really of a piece in a strange way. I do want to check out Crashing at some point, and I am very, very excited to see what a Bond movie written by Phoebe Waller-Bridge would be. And I have started writing a script for a video on Rogue One, so look forward to that. And yeah, thank you all for watching. See you in the next one.